Good morning. Uh, I'm Debbie Grierson, part of the women's ministry leadership here at PTC, along with Barb Hicks and Sarah Ibbotson. It's wonderful to be here in person this morning. Craig and I have been joining in online the past months, so it's great to be here and see you. I'm excited to highlight the announcement in our bulletin regarding the new women's Bible study we are planning to start in early February. The study is called Truth Filled by Ruth Cho Simmons, and I just want to read, it's from Lifeway, a little excerpt here. It's a video-based study on the book of Colossians as she leads us through a practice of preaching gospel truth to ourselves by studying Paul's example. <clears throat> in every changing season of life, we can rest in God's character, rehearse our identity in Christ, respond in faith, and remember God's provision for us. In today's culture, there is no shortage of self-help, easy fixes, and worldly advice, <clears throat> but only the truth of God's word was meant to fill us up and satisfy us fully. So I think it's going to be a, a really great Bible study to be a part of. Any woman that is interested in being a part, either through Zoom or in person, will be starting in early February on Thursdays from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, facilitated by Jeannie Houghton. Sarah Ibbotson will also be there. Um, we are also wanting to offer a Thursday evening time option as well. And if there's enough interest, um, we will go ahead with it Thursday evenings on Zoom or in person. And I will be involved uh, with that time. Please let us know. We, we need to know if you're interested uh, so we can plan. The Bible study books are $25, and you can pay at the church office for those. We are also excited to start another Prayer Sister program here at PTC. Please watch your email inbox for an email from Barb Hicks about that in the near future. We have a few other ideas and plans simmering and look forward to sharing those with you as plans come together. We love you, you women of PTC, young and old. If there's anything we can do or be praying for, please let us know. Ah, buenos dias con todos. Oops. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeanette, uh, Rick Maxwell's wife. Uh, first of all, I want to thank God for his, for his great love, grace, mercy, and faithfulness. I also want to thank God for past leadership, teachers, and helpers who worked hard ministering our, to our children before and during COVID-19. It's been about two months since I was invited to pray about uh, taking on the role of children's ministry director for this year. It is a big responsibility, yes. Uh, am I so alone that I can't do, that, do it? No, God has promised to be with us wherever we go. Do I sometimes experience fears and feel inadequate? The truth is, many times I do. But God is teaching me to trust in him, replace my fears with faith, and be strong and courageous. My prayer is that his strength be my portion. Am I busy? Very busy. Um, but also very excited because I know God is in it. Pastor Ed has been coaching me since I uh, accepted this position, has been very patient. He has been very patient. <laughs> I invited Joni Wiley, Teresa Yo, and Elizabeth Miller to be my advisors. Can I change this? Oops. Yeah. Um, as part of children's leadership team, 
We've been uh, busy planning the last three Thursdays in a row. Proverbs 16 explains that we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. With COVID-19, everything is uncertain, but that doesn't mean we can't stop planning. We'd been foolish if we did. We commit our plans to God and hold them in open hands for him to do his will, not ours. As you can see in the bulletin, we are very excited to announce the kickoff of our preschool through grade six children's discipleship hour, following the service February 7 at 11. For now, we are not opening the nursery. I would like to invite all of the teachers and helpers who have agreed to participate to our first orientation meeting next Sunday, the 24th at 11 a.m. Please mark your calendars. Lord willing, in March, we hope to add Children's Church during the service, offering age-appropriate content to the children of our church and community parents who would like to attend and take advantage of this ministry. If you want to be part of the children's ministry team, I'm still in need of one teacher for either grades one and two or grades three and four. And of course, additional helpers are always welcome. I would be glad to talk to you after the service today, or you can call me or send me an email. My contact information is in the bulletin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeanette and Debbie. And thank you, worship team, for leading us. I want to remind you that this coming Tuesday, there is another congregational session together on Zoom, talking about some of the changes that are coming. Also, next Sunday, we want to remind you that it's Compassion Sunday, and we will have a special guest speaker, Randy Carter, speaking from Compassion. <clears throat> Pastor Amer would also like to Thank all those who came to the um, small group leaders meeting yesterday. There were about 20 people there. And we look forward to some real good activity as we gather in small groups. The ladies of WMF have an announcement. And they're glad that the pastors and board of elders would like you to put this on your calendar a ladies' mission connection event happening this Saturday, January 23rd at 2 p.m. by Zoom. Saturday is going to be a busy day. It will be a time to get to know Norma Douglas, as she will be sharing, and Irene will be sending out the Zoom invitation to all you ladies by email. I also want to remind you of Dr. Luke Savage's session Saturday, January 23rd, again, from 9 to 12, talking about Bill C-6 and Bill C-7. And any of us who are working with seniors or others need to know what's coming down. Now I'm going to ask Lynn Calloway to come and share her testimony with us. Good morning. That was that was that sounded good. <laughs> um, I'm here to tell you that there is power in prayer. About one and a half years ago, um, actually, it was the same day my dad went to heaven. I got a, just a regular sore throat, but there was a virus and attacked my heart. And um, I've been recovering, had been recovering well. In fact, very well. So well that my specialist had said before Christmas, um, let's, I think we can just take you right off that medication. Well, two weeks later, Dan was rushing me up to the ER. I couldn't breathe. I, I was fighting for every breath. My lungs had pretty much filled with fluid and um, due to an issue with my heart. Well, the doctor came out after they were working with me. The doctor came out and said to Dan, you know, your wife is doing very, very poorly and um, she's not responding to 
our medical interventions. It was at that point that Dan got on the phone. He just started calling people to pray. And you know, shortly after that, I literally felt a change in my body and a turnaround. Um, the ambulance was uh, rushing me up to Red Deer, and those EMTs are great. Um, they were monitoring me, of course, and I heard them say, look at that, her, her blood pressure is coming down. And, oh, wow, look at that, her, her oxygen level is coming up. And by the time I reached Red Deer Hospital, I pretty much stabilized. Well, they admitted me into ICU, and uh, that morning, that early that morning at 3 o'clock in the morning, they woke me up. I was just doing too well, so they moved me. <laughs> um, the next morning, uh, the heart specialist came in, and he was just almost shaking his head, and he said, you have had a spectacular recovery. You know, and I told him, I said, you know, there are many people praying, and this was the power of prayer. And I am so grateful. I'm grateful to be here. And I'm, I've never experienced the power of prayer in such a, such a real way. Um, our time is short. Um, none of us here have the next hour guaranteed. Um, are we ready to meet God? You know, if you're not sure, our pastors or our trusted Christian friend would love to talk to you. I also was impressed with our time being short and using it. Um, for the kingdom of God. This week, or this Christmas, two days after Christmas, um, I got word that one of the top guys in um, one of the uh, suppliers in Toronto that I used to book missionary travel, travel um, had passed away suddenly. And I recall back to where I was on my last face-to-face -face conversation with him. And I remember we talked about the brevity of life and I do remember talking about, oh, I love helping missionaries because I really believe in what, they do, what they're doing. And he seemed quite intrigued. Um, I have no idea if those few words made any impact on him, but I do know that God tells us to plant the seeds, and it's the Holy Spirit that does the rest. You know, there, our time is short, and there is power in prayer. Thank you for sharing, Lynn. With that challenge to prayer, let's go to prayer. <clears throat> we come to you, Father, you who desire to have us stand before you holy and blameless and above reproach in Christ. We confess that sometimes we're lazy in our quest to growing in you lazy about becoming mature believers according to our age and according to the length of time that we have walked with you. Thank you that in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, you've provided everything that we need to grow in you. Help us, Lord, to walk with the Spirit that you, who you've given to us. We want to thank you this morning for Bob Savage's recovery, that he's feeling better. We thank you for Esther Mills and what you've done for her. We lift up Hester Rendell to you. We trust you, Lord, for the miracle that circulation will begin again in her leg and she won't need the amputation. Bless that couple, Lord. Bless Ted as he continues to teach even in his 87th year. We pray for the United States. Lord, we are so saddened when we see what's happening there. We pray for your people everywhere, that they could be lights during this time of fear and frustration. Lord, help them to stay themselves on you and be your witness during this time. Help them to be mature. We pray for all governments, for our own government on all levels. 
We lift up our missionary, Lori Lawson. We thank you for what you've been doing for her in Taiwan. We pray for wisdom for her as she deals with students from various places, various levels, some non-Christian. We think of some who she's really working with and has a heart for. Give her wisdom as she speaks and works with them. We pray for Dr. Imnaeus in Ethiopia, that Lord, you will touch him in his battle with COVID. Lord, he's a, he's a key person and we pray that your hand would be there with him and that others watching will see you at work in his life, bringing him back to full health. Thank you, Lord, now for time to go into your word and we pray for Dr. Ed as he brings what you've laid on his heart. We pray that you will open our hearts as we hear you speak to us through the Holy Spirit, through your word. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. What a privilege it is we have. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, good to be with you again. Isn't it going to be great when we don't have to wear these anymore? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it's just a matter of time, I think, before... Uh, That'll be a reality, and we uh, trust that uh, God's going to bring that about soon. Uh, but in the meantime, we're uh, thankful that uh, you're working with it and making the most out of it, that so many of you are here, and thankful that we can connect with all kinds of people around the world, which we wouldn't ordinarily have the privilege of doing. But because of what's happened, we have this new capacity now, thanks to the techno te technical people, to uh, preach the word beyond our own town, our own church. Well, um, last Sunday I spoke to you a little about the importance of vision, both in our own lives and in the life of the church. <clears throat> and then how our understanding of the nature of the gospel ought to be the foundation of what the vision of the church is all about. <clears throat> you know, if we believe that Jesus coming, his death and resurrection, is the greatest thing that has ever happened to, in the history of the world, then that will be a huge, have a huge bearing on what we do with our lives individually and in the life of the church. And today I just want to build on that a little to talk about how Christian faith develops from our understanding of the gospel. And in a way, uh, this is more of a lesson, perhaps, than a sermon, uh, but very, very relevant to our lives. This illustrates, perhaps, a more of a teaching approach to uh, what we do on Sunday mornings, uh, but very, very important. You know, it's one thing to embrace the gospel but how should this response make a difference in our daily lives? So I want to speak to you today about the importance and nature of what it means to grow up in Christ, to become mature in Him, to experience and live out the holiness that God has given to us in Christ. In a way, this is what Paul's burden is as he comes to write the words of Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. And as we look at this passage, we see that he is building on what these folks have experienced in the reality of the gospel. He talks here about walking in a manner worthy of that calling. He talks about how it should impact our relationships with one another. And he speaks about the exercise of the spiritual gifts of service that God has given us. And he speaks about all of this in relation to spiritual maturity. Follow with me as I read these words from Ephesians 4, please. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope 
when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect uh, the uh, mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Lord, we just thank you for these words that were written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit and are of such great importance not only in the, to the people of that time but to us even today. We pray that you would reveal your truth to us as you intended it, apply it to our hearts, help us to discern what you are seeking to say to us individually and together this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's the references to maturity here that I'm particularly interested in this morning, and they lead us to ask the question of what it looks like for Christians and the church to be spiritually mature. Of course, this is a passage that is speaking about the maturity of the body, but in a very real sense, <clears throat> it speaks to us uh, about individual maturity as well. There are other portions of scripture that really emphasize this matter of our own individual maturity. James comes to mind, Colossians, Hebrews, all speak of becoming perfect, if you like, in Christ. <clears throat> well, this is a big subject, and these days we often uh, speak of this in terms of spiritual theology or the theology of spirituality. And it has to do with how to live as a truly holy person. He wants us to be holy, to grow up in Christ, to become mature. First Peter 1, 15 and 16 speaks of this. It says, just as he who called you is holy, so be you holy in everything you do, for it is written, Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. <clears throat> and in the Bible, this matter of holiness is a very important application of the gospel. And it is often spoken of as sanctification, as in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify, sanctify you through and through. And this refers to true cleansing, and it has to do with Christian maturity, as we see here in Ephesians chapter 4. And in this, the idea is that it is one thing to trust Christ as Savior from sin, but it's quite another to trust him to help us live out the holiness for which the gospel was given. In other words, we put our trust in Christ not only to escape the judgment of sin, that is coming upon the world or that is upon the world, but we also uh, put our faith in Christ and trust him to experience the very life of God within while we are here on earth as we prepare for heaven. But the question is, uh, what does a holy person or a mature Christian really look like? What does it mean for us to actually live 
as holy people, so that we bear the image of Jesus Christ himself in our homes, in the church, and in our communities. Well, you know, this question is probably one of the biggest reasons why there are so many different church denominations. Different groups have different ideas or emphases from scripture on how to be spiritual, how to live holy lives. Typically, those from a Presbyterian or Reformed or Baptist kind of background believe that sanctification takes place at the moment of faith or at baptism and that practical sanctification is an ongoing process in our lives. If you know anything about Roman Catholic theology, some of you will recognize that uh, they tend to place a strong emphasis on suffering as a means of sanctification. Pentecostal groups emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit in sanctification distinct and separate work of God's grace after salvation, a special experience of the spirit of those who become, after we become Christians. You know, my own denominational heritage emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit as both a crisis and a progressive thing in the life of a Christian after salvation. And then, of course, there are those of you who come and have been associated with Prairie College or Prairie Bible Institute for many years. And as I read about the founder, Ellie Maxwell especially, and the ministry here, I discovered that he spoke of sanctification, and you would recognize this immediately, as identifying with Christ in his death and resurrection. He spoke often of the crucified life which resulted, should result in a very disciplined lifestyle. Well, in my own experience, I've had a variety of influences that have given me different perspectives on how sanctification work, works. Early on, especially through the ministry of a parachurch organization called The Navigators, which began with Dawson Trotman during the Second World War, uh, and it was especially influential among Navy men in the U.S., but also had an, uh, a, a real ministry to college students as I was getting into my late teens. I learned about discipleship, about living daily in obedience to Christ, about knowing and memorizing scripture and applying it to my life. And I'm very, very grateful for what the navigators taught me about obedience to, script, to the scriptures. Sometime later, I learned about the ministry of the Spirit in a more personal way. And then more recently, about the value of practicing what we call spiritual disciplines. And in the end, I came to realize that all of this really was Paul's subject here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, especially at the end, and in other places as well when he speaks there about becoming spiritually mature. So, which is it? What does a spiritually mature disciple of Christ look like? Is it possible, actually, I wondered, to measure whether a person is growing in spiritual maturity? And you know, from a pastoral point of view, I've concluded that this is a very, very important question. The reason being, that in so many way, ways, this is the goal of what pastoral work is really all about, to help individuals and the church towards spiritual maturity. I considered that perhaps there was a way to, we could actually track this and plan for it and possibly actually measure it to some degree. And rather than different views on holiness being in sort of competition with one another, we could actually learn something from each of them as they were grounded in the truth of the scriptures. So I began to think of the possibility of stages of spiritual maturity. And I developed what I came to call a plot line of spiritual development. 
And the idea here is that just as a person develops physical maturity over the years, so it might be possible to see the development of spiritual maturity. And you'll see in your outline, in the bulletin, what I'm thinking here already. And I just wanted to sort of use this as an analogy in terms of how we grow in our spiritual lives. Well, it's obvious that birth is a starting point. Sometimes it's referred to in the scriptures as regeneration, where the idea of spiritual birth being based on Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John 3. But we read of this in other places as well, like 1 Peter 1.23, where it says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. This is a supernatural act of grace. No one is born a Christian. New birth is the conscious realization that you have come into a relationship with Christ. Something happens within our spirits when we come to believe who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And sometimes a person may not recall exactly where or when this happened. But the reality is that spiritual life in Christ has a beginning, a time when someone comes to the realization that they are now consciously confessing Christ. I want to ask you this morning, has this happened in your life? Can you can remember how and when it took place? You know, if you haven't been born again of the Spirit, it's such a simple thing. It can happen just that quickly as you confess who Jesus is and open your heart to him. And if that's never happened to you, why not allow it to happen this morning by saying yes to Jesus and confessing him? According to the scriptures, baptism in water confirms this confession. Technically, baptism is not a requirement for salvation, but it's a natural result of, of wanting to follow Jesus, of making this confession of faith. Baptism is a way in which this is done. We have a lovely baptismal tank here. I'd love to see it used one of these days as someone makes this public confession of their faith in Christ. But it's an important expression of what it means to be born again. Have you been baptized? Have you confessed Christ by this very biblical and important means? Wonderful that the church has provision for that. But sometimes baptism is associated with a second stage of spiritual maturity, which I call infancy. What is the most common characteristic of a baby? Well, we might think of many things, but one key factor is that a baby is trying to relate to his or her surroundings. In infancy, a baby becomes aware of his or her parents, of siblings, of aunts and uncles, grandparents, and so on. And in actual life experience, this is a very important stage because in this stage, a person forms his or her sense of identity, their feelings about themselves. And most of this comes from interaction with their family members. And of course, potentially, depending, this can be very negative. But a tender, loving environment makes all the difference, which is why parenting is such an important matter. Well, for a Christian, the early days of his or her experience is extremely important. Often, new Christians struggle with all kinds of things because they haven't settled the identity issue. We tend to naturally base our perception of self on the kinds of things that happened in our childhood. We need to become aware of the fact that we are not merely the product of our human inheritance with, in many cases, all of its problems and difficulties. So as Christians, we need to come to the place where we realize that our true identity is in Christ, into his death and his resurrection. And of course, this is a major theme in the writing of the apostles. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 3 puts it this way. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we might too live a new life. And if this is true, then in becoming a Christian and confessing that in baptism, the most important aspect of our identity is that we know that we belong to God. And as a believer, it's important for us to know that we've been adopted as a child into God's family. You have the same spiritual DNA as your Father in heaven, just as Jesus did. I remember how significant this was to me as I was growing up in my Christian faith. I think I was in ministry for a time before I realized the tremendous significance of the fact that I am identified with Jesus. I think I was reading through Ephesians. and There are many instances in Ephesians, especially the first chapter, where, where Paul speaks about being in him. Uh, in him, we have been chosen to be blameless. In him, we have redemption. In him, we are marked with a seal, the seal of the Holy Spirit, and so on. Have you come to realize that your true identity is not in your national or even your sexual heritage necessarily? It's who you are in Christ. What a difference that makes. Well, that's the second stage. We've got a ways to go here, don't we? Childhood is the third stage, and here the emphasis is a bit different again. Childhood is all about the primary years of school, the three R's, writing, reading, writing, and arithmetic, as they say. It's all about becoming a learner, in time in which we, a time in which we learn how to read and write, but also what it means to pay attention to authority in our lives. And from a Christian perspective, it is what I call the discipleship stage of our spiritual maturity, and it is very important. You know, every person who comes to recognize who Jesus is and puts his or her trust in him is also being called to the life and experience of discipleship. Being a Christian is all about being a disciple of Jesus. It is being in the school of Jesus, if you like, learning what it means to follow him in everything. Discipleship is living in a relationship to Jesus Christ, taking up his cross daily, and following him. It means getting to know God's truth in his word and applying it to your life. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you really are my disciples. John 8, 31, 32. And it is about learning to take seriously what it means to go and make disciples, how to share our faith with others. So if you've been a believer in Christ for any reasonable length of time, I hope you've come to terms with what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Later, we come to what I call the adolescent stage, the teenage years, the early teenage years. What are the distinctives of adolescence? Well, if you are one, or you have been one, (laughs) or you have one, you will certainly know what some of the distinctives are of adolescence. This is often a turbulent stage in our growing up years. It is both very exciting, but can also be very very confusing. We become aware of our feelings, feelings of romance, for example, in relation to the opposite sex. We have mixed emotions. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. Do you remember that? Well, it was certainly true for me. And because we feel our emotions keenly at this stage, I relate this stage in our Christian lives to the experience of getting to know about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who he is and how he works. It's very important that we learn to know about the ministry of the Spirit, that he is able to minister to us as Jesus did to his disciples. The Bible has a lot to say about the ministry of the Spirit. John speaks of him as counselor and guide. John 14, 25, But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. 
It is the Spirit who gently woos us to understand God's truth and point us to Jesus. He is the one who prays for us and in us and gives us the power to live and serve God. And just as the teen years are often times of struggle and feelings of failure, so it's possible during this stage to wrestle with various ups and downs in our spiritual lives. Sometimes we're up and sometimes we're down. Sometimes we feel close to God, sometimes far away. And so it is, I believe, that we have to come to the place where we recognize the importance of the Holy Spirit and yield our lives totally and completely to him. Where by faith we trust him to fill our lives completely. This might be an experience accompanied by a variety of emotions and other manifestations, but mostly it is about letting the Spirit have complete control of it in our lives. Like Ephesians 5.18 says, be continuously filled with the Spirit. And I don't think there's, and, and you know, this has to do, I think, often with addictions in our lives too. We, many of us struggle with various kinds of addictions. And if we're honest, these things manage our lives in a way that is not pleasing to God, right? So what do we do about that? If we're really going to move closer to the Lord and allow him to be control in our lives, we've got to deal with that kind of stuff, right? And uh, so it is, I think, that the Holy Spirit is the one who can help us overcome those addictions as we identify them, are honest about them, and yield our lives to him. There is no maturity in the Christian life without getting to know the Holy Spirit. The fifth stage is about what we might refer to as the young adult stage. Well, this is about a young man or woman who is just graduating from high school and getting ready for the real work of work or study. In Lamentations 3.27, it says, it is, a good, it is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. It is good for the young adult to learn that life is hard work and requires all kinds of discipline, to learn that good comes from suffering and toil. As I said earlier, in recent years, the Christian church has been learning more about what it means or what has come to be called spiritual formation. And the idea of spiritual formation is based on scriptures like Romans 8.29, where it says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it talks about being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory as we contemplate the Lord's glory. Galatians 4.19, Paul says that he prays that he's in childbirth, he's in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, he says to the Galatians. And many of the great saints of scripture and history committed themselves to various dif disciplines that helped them receive the work of the Spirit in their lives. And sometimes these were spoken of as means of grace, because as God leads us to practice these, they open to us the ministry of the Spirit in some wonderful ways. And in recent years, as I said, there's been a great deal of emphasis on this. This might include things like practicing, committing to practice daily scripture reading and meditation spending daily time in personal prayer and contemplation. Coming to church regularly is a discipline, a spiritual discipline. Many times you may feel that you don't want to do this. There's so many distractions, but you do it because you're committed to the principle of this spiritual discipline of worshiping together with God's people. Maybe it has to do with keeping a journal Maybe a spiritual discipline has to do with practicing Sabbath, regularly taking time to focus your attention on the worship of God as we do, have been led to do on some people on Saturday, some people, most of us on Sunday. 
Or it may be a matter of being willing to enter into experiences of suffering of one kind or another. Recently, God has been speaking to me, even this week, about the importance of fasting. It's a spiritual discipline. Fasting is the idea of coming, setting aside time to, to really focus your attention on the Lord by not eating or eating less or something like that. What do we know about fasting in our experience? Can we consider the difference this would make in our lives if we opened our lives to that? And then later, this, this, even today, I was thinking that the whole matter of tithing, for example, or giving a regular portion of our income to the Lord is sort of a spiritual discipline. And, and uh, the blessing that comes from this as we open our lives to the Lord by these means is, is amazing. We begin to hear his voice to understand his will in ways that perhaps we hadn't before, and we see his power released in new ways in our lives. What do you know about this whole thing of spiritual discipline or the spiritual disciplines in your experience? Well, perhaps we could refer to the sixth stage of human development of finally reaching adulthood. And in this stage, people typically are getting serious about relationships and about taking on responsibility for themselves and others, getting a job, earning money, and entering into a deep personal relationship with others, possibly getting married, having a family. But have you noticed, sometimes marriage isn't the dream we thought it might be, and having children isn't particularly romantic either. And it is then that we come face to face with the reality of our own emotional and spiritual deficiencies. I've often said, there's nothing like marriage and having a family to help us see who we really are, <laughs> to see ourselves. And from a biblical and Christian perspective, it is in the difficult experiences and relationships of our lives that we come face to face with ourselves and our need for God's grace. Our souls cry out for genuine love and joy and peace. We need to know the difference between living self-centered lives, resulting in discord and pain, and living spirit-controlled lives that produce the wonderful fruit of the spirit. And as we go through life, we all suffer from relationship failures of one kind or another. But these are opportunities to discover the sweet fruit of the spirit that enables us to bless those that curse us and pray for those that despitefully use us. In the adulthood stage of spiritual development, we learn to practice the fruit of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit there, it says, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, says the old King James Version, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, you know you've met a mature Christian when you meet someone who can handle the uglies of life with grace. That brings us to the seventh stage, or the eighth stage. <clears throat> uh, I call it the maturing adult. In a natural life here, we're thinking as someone who is getting well along in life, perhaps in their 30s or 40s. <laughs> and in this stage, people are usually well on the way to discovering who they are and what kinds of things they are really able to do. And in Christian experience, this is that place in life where we discover that life is really about serving Christ with the particular gifts of the Spirit that he has given to us for ministry. The Bible makes it clear that knowing your ministry gift and using it, or them, is a very important part of what it means to be a Christian. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, To each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, discernment, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Romans 12 mentions other gifts, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, and leading, showing mercy. I think it's really important for us to discover what our gifts for ministry are. There are a whole variety of ways in which this can come about, but usually 
It has to do with someone else saying, I think you have a particular gift in this area. This may happen earlier in a person's life, but if it does, it sure takes maturity to know how to use the gift so that a gift doesn't become a source of pride and division among God's people as it did in the uh, church in Corinth. I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to discover how God has equipped us to function in the body of Christ how he can use a talent or a spiritual gift to build the body of Christ. I ask you this morning, do you know your spiritual gift? Have you thought about that in the terms of what the scriptures have to say about that? Well, there is something nice about uh, growing older, about becoming a senior adult, isn't there? As a person gets older and really matures, hopefully they get to know themselves well enough to see that they have a particular contribution to make to life. In a way, these years, these senior years, should be those wonderful, satisfying years in which we live and work with confidence and fruitfulness. I'm thinking there's also such a thing in our Christian lives as coming to that place where we know who we are in Christ, we know our gifts for service, and we know how we can make the best possible contribution uh, to the kingdom and to the church. And you don't have to be old in order to recognize what this is. This can happen earlier in your life, of course. And this was true for Paul and the other apostles. At first, they were just ordinary men, but then God showed them what he called them to do. In Ephesians 3, 7, 8, Paul writes, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul came to realize what his calling was, what, what it was that God had in mind for him to do. Have you come to that place? Hopefully, hopefully before you get old. <laughs> well, my contention this morning in this message is that just as we mature physically, perhaps it's possible for us to measure our spiritual progress toward maturity as well. Obviously, it's not going to be quite as mechanical as I've outlined it here. There are times when, like me, you're going to feel that you're still learning some of the basics. God humbles us to help us realize that we're not as mature sometimes as we thought we were. But I'm wondering whether an outline like this could be a model by which we measure our own spiritual development or even that of the church. That it begins with conversion, that it concerns our Christian identity, particularly uh, expressed through baptism, that it is a matter of coming to a place where we are really devoted to seeking to understand and obey the scriptures, that we really understand and appreciate the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the value of spiritual disciplines, the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and knowing our particular place of service. Isn't it great to grow up God didn't intend us to remain children, didn't, did he? And the desire of our hearts as we're young is to grow up, to become mature. And so it is for the development of our spiritual lives as well. This takes patience. It doesn't all happen overnight. Becoming spiritually mature means getting to the place where we know who we are in Christ and what he has called us to, to be and to do. It is being confident in our faith, being knowledgeable, knowledgeable about what it is and how to share that faith with others. So where are you in your spiritual development? Are you moving forward and upward? Can you and others see a difference of where you were from a number of years ago? What is the trajectory of your spiritual life? It's OK if you're still discovering this process. Uh, you don't have to have arrived. We're all in a process, we're all in a journey. But I hope that somehow this morning 
this helps you to see the nature of that journey. And then, the, you know, could pastors or elders or even small group leaders and other ministry leaders use this as a reference to help individuals toward their spiritual maturity? I commend this model of steps to spiritual maturity to you today for God to use in helping you grow up in Christ. I want to lead you in a prayer, but uh, at the end of the service, if you have questions or would like spiritual help in some of the ways that we've talked about it here today, I'm going to be here at the front. I'm not going to try to greet people outside because it's kind of difficult anyway. But if, if you have a question about all of this, if you can relate to this in some way, if you want prayer, I invite you to come and pray with myself or pa Pastor Armour or Pastor Glenn or others who might be willing to come and pray with others and uh, to seek the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the gospel, the good news concerning Jesus, that how your person was revealed in all of its wonder and beauty in the person of this one called Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your plan to draw us to yourself so that we could be with you forever, that we could be an actual holy people. We thank you that that's how you see us through our faith in Christ, which is a marvelous thing, but you also want us to conform to that image in our daily lives, that we live in this world in our relationships as holy people. Help us, we pray, to, to know about how our experience is moving us toward maturity in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for all the ways in which you have instructed us in your word concerning these things. And this morning, this is just simply a, a bit of a sketch along these lines. I pray that you would take us deeper into our understanding of what it means to live holy lives, to become mature in Christ, no matter where we are. Thank you for your grace toward us and your mercy. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us today. I leave you with this benediction from Hebrews 13 that says, Now may the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect or mature in every good work, doing that which is pleasing in his sight, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>